Please welcome live from our New York studio, David Rubenstein, co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group and his panelists. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have assembled at the beginning of this conference an all-star global panel of investors and professionals in the financial world. I'd like to introduce them and then get into questions that we have. It's an extraordinary group we've been able to assemble. I want to thank the uh, organizers for doing this and thank them for letting me moderate it. At, I'd like to uh, thank Yasser particularly, Yasser al uh, is going to be on the panel. I want to thank him as the chairman of the FIA Institute and the governor at the Public Investment Fund of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. On the panel as well will be Ray Dalio, who's the co-chairman and co-CIO of Bridgewater Associates, Larry Fink, who is the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, uh, Dr. Thomas Gottstein, who's the CEO of Credit Suisse, and with me here in the studio in New York, David Solomon, who's the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. Let me start, if I could, by asking all of you whether you think that 2021 will be the same for the stock market and the investment market as 2020, which is to say that despite the pandemic in 2020, the investment markets, the credit markets, stock markets did pretty well. Do you expect that this can continue through 2021? So why don't I start with our host, Yasser. Uh, Yasser, what do you expect to happen in the global stock markets and credit markets in 2021? First of all, uh, good morning, uh, David. It's always good to see you, even if it's uh, virtually. But I hope with this um, conference, we're bringing in together people from different hubs. And it's um, a hybrid between uh, in-person and uh, virtual. So uh, really, thank you. To answer your question, uh, 2020, the start of the pandemic had a very severe uh, impact and effect on uh, economies around the world and also the uh, equity markets and the capital markets. All the financial markets were severely impacted at the initially in end of February, beginning of uh, March. Most of the markets went down between 27 to 30 plus percent. But surprisingly, uh, the markets, especially the U.S. market and some, uh, some of the other global markets, went to all-time high towards the end of uh, 2020, which created, to my mind, some kind of inequality between the people uh, with funds and monies waiting on the uh, sidelines and the real working class. Working class, uh, uh, category lost most of them or some of them lost their jobs because their jobs are always in the conventional economies such as travel, tourism, retail, consumer, generally speaking. And um, most of these sectors suffered quite tremendously. But um, people with funds like asset managers, family offices, people of the higher uh, classes, they saw this as a good opportunity. And that's why everybody was chasing the same opportunity, which are the financial markets. I think it's about time for all of us to start not only thinking about their um, self financial benefits, but to see what impact that we can bring into uh, the markets. Three days ago, the PIF announced its second phase of our vision realization program, which is part of our strategy from 2021 until 2025. And it's going to be followed by another phase, which leads us to the vision 2030 of Saudi Arabia. Part of that strategy, we said we want to not only invest in the financial markets, we want to invest in the new projects to have an impact on the financial growth, the GDP growth, the job creation, and creating new business opportunities. So with that, uh, I think the disconnect between the financial markets and real economies would, uh, would have a, um, maybe uh, a smaller impact to the lives of all the people living uh, around us. <clears throat> so that's what uh, we've been uh, doing. We all 
we're, we're also looking at the conventional um, uh, companies or economies and looking at the new future economies. And the third category is the pre-pandemic, the pre-COVID economy that l led us to invest in technologies, which without these technologies, none of us would continue on living. I mean, uh, again, this conference is just a demonstration how technology can help to link different continents, different cities, different people, all at the same time, and we feel like we're sitting uh, all uh, together. So we will, um, as I said earlier, we will continue on investing uh, on things that will impact the real uh, economy and at the same time to invest in financial markets. So we will be uh, making money, to hitting all of our uh, financial targets, but at the same time having uh, an impact. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Gottstein, uh, you are in uh, the kingdom, so why don't I just ask you next, how do you think the markets are going to react uh, in 2021 to the ongoing pandemic? Do you expect that markets will continue to be as strong as they have been in 2020? Yeah, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Your Excellency uh, for the invitation to be here on this panel. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a very important market for Credit Suisse, and it's an honor and pleasure for me to be here. So we saw 2020 to be, as you said, a very strong stock market, somewhat disconnected from the broader economy. Uh, and to some extent, you could argue some of the valuations are at elevated levels, and some of the expected recovery is already priced in. But on the other hand, our house view remains very constructive on equities, given the low interest rate environment. Uh, given the expected recovery that we all hope for and expect, uh, especially in the second half of 2021. Uh, and uh, there are certain sectors uh, where we also expect earnings to come up quite significantly over the next few quarters, uh, including also some industries that maybe have not done so well, some cyclicals, banks, construction companies, etc. So from that perspective, our house view remains constructive on equities and we expect 21 to be a good year for equities. Okay, uh, let's go to Ray Dalio. Ray, I believe you're in Connecticut. Uh, how do you see the markets in 2021? You think they'll be as ebullient as they were in 2020 and what are you uh, worried about, if anything? Uh, no, I don't think they will be as ebullient in um, the next year. Uh, <laughs> uh, just mechanically, <clears throat> I think we have to look at the weight of money, the creation of credit and money as distinct from the actual level of economic activity because the big event of last year with the virus was the need um, to create a lot of debt uh, to, so that the government could distribute the money that was needed. And then governments around the world, central banks, had to print a lot of money to provide that. And naturally, as that money worked itself through the system, it changed the financial landscape. So I think a lot of people are paying attention to the rate of economic activity and not the impact on m the value of money and that particular dynamic. Uh, that dynamic, as it passed through the system, created a lot of money and credit, which made a world of difference. And that, as a result, not only brought down interest rates and real interest rates, So now you have a negative 1% or so real interest rates. But that effect um, brought, um, extended to other asset classes. And so their expected returns went down and their, as their prices went up. So that effect, as we go forward, uh, will be diminishing. Um, as we come into the new year, 
we're going to um, see, uh, likely assuming the vaccine scenario plays out, and that, that can't be 100% assured, but let's assume it does, you'll see a rebound in growth and you'll see a rebound in inflation. You also notice that currency changes. You have to pay attention to currency changes because the value of money is very important. So when we see, for example, the dollar went down by 12% as a result of this monetary policy. And so when we value things and we look at stocks and, and bonds, what we see it is that um, they go up, but the, the currency goes down. So as we go into this new period, I think you're going to see a pickup in growth and in and inflation. And with that, you're going to also see a pickup in deficits. And that pickup in deficits means that the government's doing that, particularly the United States, will have to sell a lot more bonds to the rest of the world. So the supply of bonds will come to the rest of the world. I don't believe there's enough demand for those bonds um, when we look at the supply and demand picture. And so it's reasonably likely that by later in the year, um, you, you will have to see the Federal Reserve come in and buy more of that bond, those bonds to make up the gap. So it's going to be a very interesting and challenging year. And the key will be in financial flows, even more than in um, actually economic rates of activity. So I would encourage investors to pay attention to the supplies and demands of money and credit and the values of money and credit in the new year. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, Larry, uh, what did you account for the strong market last year? What do you think will happen this year? And your investors, which are an <coughs> extraordinary group of investors from all over the world, your clients, what are they telling you now about their biggest concerns? Larry is, I think, in another location in New York. I am in another location in New York, and it's good to be part of it. Uh, Yasser, I'm sorry I'm not in the kingdom with you today. Um, I, th I would say investors, David, um, spoke very loudly. We have witnessed huge changes in how we consume, how we work, how we uh, use medicine. We've seen great miracles in terms of discovering a vaccination in 10 months. We have, before that, the earliest vaccination took four years, and that was mumps. And so we are seeing a revolution in technology, and capitalism really flourished in 2020. All the foundations of issues that Ray spoke about, I totally agree upon. On the other hand, so many the savings rates in so many countries actually accelerated um, during this pandemic. And as so many people were working from home, they're not spending the money on commuting, or many cases they're not spending money on rent and moving back home. And, 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 and so there is this big pool of savings, um, bigger than ever, and hopefully a lot of this pool of savings moves more into the individual retirements, and we're starting to see that. Even in, in like in January, the mutual and flows that we've witnessed are at really high levels. I think in, in Europe this month alone, we're seeing close to 10, million, 10 billion, uh, excuse me, there we go. We're Larry, seeing $10 billion dollars your, of inflows. You have to change your yeah. uh, phone ringtone. It's about time, Larry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, yes, sir. Well, no one else has it, so everybody knows it's me. Well, that was the chairman uh, of the that was the chairman of the Federal Reserve calling up to ask Larry's view on what's going on. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, I wish it was. It wasn't. Uh, anyway, um, we're seeing huge inflows, uh, and so money is being put to work. Look at. The financial markets are all about uh, talking about the ins and outs of the marketplace. The reality is large pools of money that are, that are for sovereign wealth funds and, and for retirement are about long investing. I write about um, uh, climate change and environmental issues. Um, we're going to have to put $50 trillion to work to really get to a net carbon uh, zero world. 
Uh, so the amount of innovation that's necessary is remarkable, the amount of capital that's necessary. Um, and so I'm actually quite bullish over a long horizon that we are going to find solutions to do this. Uh, and, and through those solutions, I think markets overall are going to be fine for long-term investors. Does that mean we're going to have a up market in 2021? Um, I think I think it's going to be closer to flat, maybe a little down, maybe a little up, but it's not going to be as ebullient as last year. But we are going to see as we move towards uh, herd immunity, and that will probably be closer to the fourth quarter, hopefully parts of the third quarter, where more and more countries will have inoculated the majority of the population, and we could we could have more normalization. And, and through normalization of our economy, we're going to see a broadening of the economy. We're going to see the components of the economy were left behind. The aggregation of human beings, conferences, travel, entertainment, culture, sports. We're going to start beginning to see those components of the economy picking up again. And at the same time, maybe you see the areas that have done so well in 2020 are going to do less well. Um, but overall, I think because of the great needs of investing for climate change and because of the pools of savings and the great need for long duration assets, I would say the fundamentals going forward into 2021 and beyond are pretty favorable for long-term investing. Okay. David, uh, David Solomon is with me in the uh, studio here in New York at Rockefeller uh, Center. Uh, David, uh, what is your view on what investors uh, are likely to do this year? Do you expect them to be as ebullient as they were last year? And explain to us, if you can, the M&A market. Do you expect a big M&A market this year? And how do people do M&A deals when they can't physically go visit people? They, everything is done on Zoom? Uh, well, uh, first, I appreciate being here, Your Excellency. Thank you for having me as part of the panel. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I don't want to rep be repetitive with respect to all that's been said uh, in the context of the markets, but I think that Ray you know, framed very, very well the things that I'm looking at and I'm thinking about in terms of trying to map the trajectory of what's going to happen in financial markets this year. I still think we have you know, very, very accommodative money, but no question an accelerating economic environment as we get through the pandemic and a reversal of some of the monetary and fiscal trends that have been so inflative for asset prices. Uh, and we'll obviously see a rotation as we get to the other side that's driving that. And that will have an impact on this year's performance. I, you know, I do agree with a lot of what Larry said about the macro environment and the fact in the medium term and the longer term, there are a bunch of things that are going on that for long-term investors make the opportunity set even more expansive. I think with respect to M&A, M&A is really driven, in my view, by confidence. Uh, and confidence shut down earlier in the year. And then as people were able to look through and look forward and kind of look through the tunnel of the pandemic and say we're going to get to the other side, I think confidence built in the second half of the year. And you saw M&A activity pick up. And in our dialogue with CEOs broadly, people are really looking at the reshaping of our economic world and saying strategically, how do I want to position? Where are there opportunities? And that led to a real acceleration in M&A activity. Now, as you said, a lot's being done virtually. Um, but there are also people that are getting on planes and finding ways to connect when they need to. There's a whole other phenomenon around private capital formation that's leading to M&A. Um, it's smaller, it's not as strategic, it's more financial, um, but the whole SPAC phenomenon obviously is leading to a lot of M&A transactions as companies that might have stayed in a private capital formation mode or might have ultimately entered the public uh, markets through a more traditional IPO or entering the public markets through the process of despacking. So I think there's a lot going on. There is an enormous amount of capital that's out, uh, that's out in the markets. But I think big companies are trying to find ways strategically to strengthen their position as all the structural changes in our economic world that have been mentioned by all the panelists come into play in the coming years. And so I think that leads to a very constructive M&A environment given the table that's been set. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. If I could ask you, uh, you've been an early and large investor in technology all over the world. Are you worried that in the United States where there's some litigation by the government against large technology companies and in Europe where there's concerns about the amount of taxes that uh, some technology companies are paying or not paying, are you still as strongly uh, supportive of large technology companies or digital transformation 
as you were last couple years? That's a very good question, uh, David. I mean, if you look at the valuation um, two years ago or last year at the beginning, and if you look at the valuation today, definitely things went uh, over the roof. So we are um, worried not only from the valuation standpoint, but from um, uh, all the points that you mentioned about how some of these uh, technology companies um, have an bigger uh, powers and um, a lot of the regulators around the road, not only in the US, but in Europe and some other parts are uh, beginning to be more uh, concerned uh, about some of the dominant uh, players. So we're um, definitely looking into it, but um, our, uh, our investment is not only going towards the uh, bigger companies, we're going to all uh, uh, spectrum of uh, technologies. We are interested not only in the um, current financial investments, as uh, you know, we go to, um, to early stage uh, investments like, you know, autonomous uh, driving, um, shared uh, economy uh, type of companies, and the pharma and healthcare uh, in addition to the uh, conventional technology uh, companies. So we are uh, definitely watching um, the situation, but at the same time, uh, as you know, we have uh, very long-term uh, views. And um, if it's in the uh, primary market, we're not that worried because things uh, starting up, but if it's in the secondary markets, in the financial markets, our worry uh, levels will definitely uh, start going higher. So, okay. to sum it uh, up to you, uh, David, um, we're just watching, and I'm really cautious uh, of maybe the disconnect between the real economy and the financial market will have to come to an end, either by the economy start going higher or the financial markets still uh, going uh, lower. We have to level it up. Okay. So Yasser, you were an early investor in Uber and I believe you're on the board of Uber. So when you're, you're in the United States and do you use Uber and do you tell them you're on the board and they should drive very safely? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, hopefully not a lot of people, uh, a lot of the drivers knows who I am, but <laughs> I'm trying to keep it uh, a bit low profile, especially with the Uber drivers after the episode that, you know, happened uh, for Travis, if you remember. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Thomas, uh, can you tell us in Europe, uh, is Brexit going to uh, be a good or bad thing for the European economy this year now that Brexit has more or less finally occurred? And are you worried about the level of debt that the European Central Bank has incurred to help keep the European economy strong? Well, I think uh, in the short term, Brexit was certainly not a good thing for Europe, for the EU, and for the UK. But, you know, coming from a country that is in the heart of Europe and is not part of the EU uh, and it's doing very well, I'm convinced that also the UK will do just fine over time. They will find their bilateral agreements, their trade agreements. They have a very strong financial center. They have a flexible uh, labor market. So uh, in the short term, it's a challenge, but at the same time, it also provoked some more intensive collaboration amongst the EU countries, and they came together for the recovery fund. They are talking about more collaboration on, on the fiscal policy side. So um, I think uh, Europe has gone through a challenging time and was probably harder hit than most other regions also in terms of COVID. But at the same time, to some extent, it's undervalued. So I think there is a good chance that uh, Europe will actually do better than maybe people think right now. Um, on the debt side, look, uh, I think at the moment, uh, people are really focused on helping uh, the broader economy to get through this crisis. In the short term, 
the indebtedness, given the low uh, yields, is not such a big issue. In the mid to long term, it could become an issue, especially if inflation comes through and interest rates uh, will go up. But um, I think right now it's really about supporting the economy, supporting especially also the SMEs and certain sectors that have been struggling. Uh, but um, you know, if you look at some countries with relatively high indebtedness, uh, uh, like Greece or France, uh, with negative yields, so at the moment this is not an issue. But, but it's clearly something people have to keep in mind for the mid to long term. And a participant in the markets in China, you've spent a lot of time studying it and being there. Uh, has China become the most important economy in the world now, more important than the United States? Here and next. So was that question to me? Sorry. Uh who did you no, I'm sorry, it was to uh, Ray. Broken up. Okay, sorry. Uh, tw I think 2020 was uh, a, defining, uh, a defining year. It'll go down in history as a defining year. Um, and I look at the long-term cycles. You know, we began a new world order in 1945. Um, and China has done a remarkable job of, uh, in almost always uh, its economy, uh, its productivity, its development of its capital markets. And um, in 2020, there was a, um, a differentiation in terms of growth. And uh, in terms of its capital markets, uh, it, it continues to open up and, and develop very attractive capital markets for foreign investors. Um, 2015, a foreign investor could only invest about two per, in two percent of the capital markets in China today. It's about sixty percent, and its competitiveness in those capital markets and its openness is attracting capital flows. And so now you have uh, two leading economies that are competing in a number of areas: um, competing in technology, competing in the capital markets, um, and right now uh, the world uh, is overweighted in dollars and dollar denominated assets and so there is a movement toward the diversification that as a result those capital flows and the relative attractiveness of their markets are causing um, the shift that we're seeing and that shift is expressed not only in their um, relatively strong performance of their uh, markets, but it's also very much reflected in the strong performance of their currency. And you're also seeing um, now uh, the internationalization of the RMB. Um, China is uh, the world's largest trading country, and um, but it, uh, it, it chose uh, to bill mostly in dollars and so on. And, um, and in that regard, it's now moving more to an internationalization of its currency. <clears throat> and so I think you're going to see the currency have more demand also. I think that these shifts are normal. If you look at the rises and declines of uh, empires or reserve currencies and so on, um, the Dutch and, uh, um, had the largest trading country um, in, in, in the 17th century and 18th century, and they had the largest financial system, and Amsterdam was the world center, and they, it was the world's reserve currency. That was passed by the British, same thing, largest financial, largest trading country in the world, became the largest reserve currency, and then it became London, the world's financial center. Same in the United States, the largest world's trading country, largest reserve currency and so on. So there's an evolutionary process that is underway in terms of that development of China and the Chinese markets that it is making it a viable competitor to the, um, the uh, um, United States, United States capital markets 
and the United States dollar. And I, I see that evolution um, as being important. Thank you. So, Larry, um, you have your pulse on the finger of what central bankers are thinking, probably more than anybody who's not a central banker. So are interest rates likely to go up at all in 2021? Do you see the Federal Reserve uh, doing anything that would increase interest rates? Or do you think for 2021, interest <coughs> rates are about where they're going to be at the end of the year? Well, I think we have two big issues that are confronting us, and that will determine the shape of interest rates next year. Uh, one, the, um, the disease curve and the speed in which the vaccinations are distributed and the speed in which any country has um, herd immunity. We estimate that herd immunities in, in many of the developed countries can be achieved somewhere around September, which is uh, basically, I would say, a medium estimate. Um, we are going to see a broadening of the economy. We're going to see those elements of the economy that are doing poorly coming back. Um, and that will then create demand for jobs um, and will, it will become somewhat more inflationary. At the same time, we, we have, as a country over the course of the last four years and continuing now, we've moved away from globalization to more uh, nationalism and buying American products. Um, that is a basic inflationary trend. Uh, in the United States, we are we make it much more difficult for immigrants to come here and, be, and, and become U.S. citizens. Um, and we're making it harder for students to get a work uh, visa. And with a great need to build out infrastructure, which I do believe the Biden administration is going to try to create, and a great need to build infrastructure in, play, in terms of climate change and the physical impact of climate change. I think we're going to have a huge amount of job creations, and this is one of the reasons why I'm constructive. But all these elements are highly um, potentially inflationary. Um, and if you look at the forward curve now of interest rates, they're suggesting uh, that we could have about a 180, 10-year. Uh, and the, the real question will be, is, is that underestimating um, wage growth as we rebuild our economy post-pandemic? Um, the need for job creation as we create a large scale infrastructure uh, projects to rebuild our economy. We still have, we have $2 trillion of deferred maintenance in our infrastructure in the United States. So I would clearly say out 22, 23, we, we are building a, um, a new regime. I think when Ray and I started in the business, we, we, hey, we grew um, up in an era of, uh, uh, era of inflation. And so, uh, and then over the last 30 years, we've just, you know, we've, we've knocked out inflation. I think it's fair to assume we are moving back into an era of growing inflation. Um, David, for many years, uh, more people seem to want to get jobs at Goldman Sachs than any place else in the world. Uh, are students coming out of business schools and colleges still as interested in working in investment banking, private equity, and Goldman Sachs? And for somebody that's watching and wants their child to get a job at Goldman Sachs, What's the best way to do other than call you directly? I, I, I appreciate that very, very narrow question, David. Um, I, I, I think finance, I think there's still a lot of interest in finance. I think finance uh, and the economic activities that we're all participating in play a very, very meaningful role in supporting the economic system that, that really does bring us all along, advances society. I, I still see enormous interest in finance broadly as a place to start a career and build a career. For some, it's a place across all the institutions represented here and so many more to, to learn, to be trained, to develop skills, to create a network, uh, to, um, to start to uh, hone your judgment, uh, et cetera. There's some people that fall in love with finance, as I did, and, and build a career around it, and there are others uh, that through that network and that experience, uh, a world opens up to other opportunities. And so I think finance is vitally important for growth and participation in the economy. Uh, and I think it'll continue to be uh, a segment of our economy that attracts uh, motivated, smart people that want to get right. engaged in helping us all move forward. So what percentage of people who apply for jobs at Goldman get them? 
uh, it's a it's it's a it's a small percentage, okay. um, but uh, but it's a small percentage at all the organizations okay. that are represented here. It's a it's a competitive world, and um, uh, and these are you know these are very very desirable jobs. Okay. So in the remaining time we have, I'd like to ask Yasser if he would uh, ask answer two questions that that we have. One is. If somebody has some money they want to invest in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where would be a good uh, sector to invest in? And secondly, how is the uh, future city, Niam, uh, coming along? And is that an opportunity for investment as well for foreign capital? So, Niam, the line was announced like uh, maybe 10 days ago or so. And uh, it's uh, a revolutionary idea. Um, so we will have, um, as the Crown Prince announced it, we'll have uh, zero emission, we will have 100% uh, renewable energy, we will reshape uh, the um, urban uh, design of uh, the next generation uh, cities. That will be a big uh, spending. The infrastructure itself will be between 100 to 200 uh, billion dollars. Uh, then after that, the next stages of uh, the uh, uh, project will uh, start. It's going to be 170 uh, kilometers length and uh, very narrow. Uh, we will be using a NEOM, especially through the line, less than 5% of the available land and the rest of it will be all uh, uh, given back to the nature. We would like the future generations to enjoy the nature around them. And that's part actually of uh, the uh, bigger macro plan that uh, the kingdom has to preserve uh, the, uh, the ecosystems and the nature. Um, so to answer uh, the uh, second part of your question or the first part, how people can invest uh, or co-invest in Saudi. We have many uh, sectors that we're uh, looking into. In our um, strategy release, the second phase of our strategy release, three days ago, we focused on 13 different sectors. These sectors will be some of them in the conventional economy and some other in the in new uh, or the future economy. So, for instance, Saudis uh, spend like $20 billion, an equivalent of $20 billion an annual basis on their tourism. So we will be investing a lot in tourism and uh, entertainment and in, uh, infrastructure and in real estate and uh, uh, renewable energy, which is something that we're really focused on. And we have um, His uh, Royal Highness Prince Abdelaziz uh, with us, the Minister of Energy, and he's going to be talking about the the, the views that uh, the kingdom has on uh, renewable. We've, um, we've uh, we started the first green energy uh, mega project in NEOM, and we got already uh, international investors with us co-investing in this project. Uh, uh, air products, in addition to some of the private sector, Aqua Power, which is uh, partially owned by PIF, and also NEOM is investing in it. So I think the variety or the menu of investment in Saudi is really big, especially that we're not only investing in the financial markets, we are investing in the real economy because that's the main driver and the main engine of growth. In addition to that, we have the government subsidy, we have the government offtake, we have the government willingness to attract this uh, international investments and domestic investors. So we're tweaking and changing the rules, the laws. Um, and I know the uh, uh, Minister of Finance, His Excellency Mohammed Jadan, with us. Hopefully, we will give even more tax holidays to the international investors. So that's the proposition that we have currently in Saudi through PIF and through the uh, private sector and through the government. Okay, so we have a little time for a question that is very important to everybody, I think, which is ESG. And so why don't I start with Thomas. Uh, how important is ESG to investors in Europe and around the world that you service? And do you think ESG is going to become 
more and more important uh, than it has been, or you think it's leveled off in terms of investor interest? Thomas? No, it's definitely further accelerating, also through COVID-19. Whether we speak to our private investors, private clients, whether it's our institutional clients, but also on the financing side, on the corporate side, as corporates go through transition, issuing green bonds, blue bonds, transition bonds, financing of renewables. So it's, uh, as somebody once said, it's like a tsunami and it's really a very important investor shift towards uh, especially environmental topics. Climate risk is on everybody's mind, so it's, it's very important. And uh, we have, as Credit Suisse, we have actually put in place a new um, uh, corporate function, which is called SRI, Sustainability Research and Investment Solution, because we also want to contribute in our content, whether it's single stock research, whether it's credit research, macroeconomic research, to cover more and more sustainability topics, have sustainability overlay when we analyze companies, uh, and also in our investment products, be it mandates, equity mandates, balance mandates for our private clients, we are putting ESG topic at the center of our investment thesis. So it's very important, and uh, we all are focused on it. Okay, so Ray, uh, you are a committed environmentalist. Um, your hedge fund is the biggest in the world. When do you uh, tell your employees and professional investors to focus on ESG? When they're making investments or do you put pressure on companies to be more compliant with good ESG standards? How do you put ESG into your investment decisions in short? Um, well, we uh, were at the lead of constructing uh, ESG investments for um, each of the pr products. There's an ESG product and we were involved in the development actually of what the rules are. And as you know, um, our, we manage money for the largest uh, institutions in the world, a lot of them. And I, in answer to your first question, I could say that um, I don't know of one that is not going to significantly by multiples increase its ESG investing. Um, uh, it's just gone through the process of developing the proper share. The, for example, the, the way the UN uh, looked into uh, created rules and, and you have to, um, how does compliance and something has to be stamped as uh, an ESG um, appropriate investment and you have to build an infrastructure. That building has um, made enormous progress, and the beginning of investing um, is is just happening. Um, so I expect that it will be um, it'll be much much larger, and uh, uh, we ex expect and hope to be um, you know helping that evolution and being on the leading edge of it. Okay, Larry, you've been a big proponent of making the certain that the companies that you're uh, organization invest in uh, comply with good ESG standards. What has been the response from large companies in which you have invested? Are they interested in what you have to say on ESG or are they just uh, paying lip service to it? Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> as I said in my 2020 letter, that, that climate change is investment risk and we're starting to see more and more evidence of that. I also asked companies to report under SASB and TCFD we saw a 366% increase in reporting under that. Um, yesterday, I reinstated those requests, plus asking each company to report on um, their movement and their how are they are moving to a net zero standard uh, in terms of carbon utilization. Um, this is not lip service. This is real. And I do believe in the coming years, through data and analytics of understanding every company, we are going to have the ability to differentiate companies. And if you look at the price performance of companies in 2020, between the companies who are more focused on stakeholders and stakeholder capitalism uh, versus the other companies in the same industry, we're seeing a widening gap of PEs. Uh, and the last thing I would say through data and analytics, we're, create, we're creating more customization and personalization of, of indexes. 
and the days of when you were gonna all look to the S&P or the FTSE or the MSCI, I believe that will become less relevant as more and more companies are gonna be designing a portfolio that meets their needs. Uh, and in, in 2020, 81% of all sustainable funds outperformed regular indexes. We are going to see this happen. It's going to accelerate and the amount of money that's moving into it is gonna represent probably the biggest change that we've seen in, in years in finance. So uh, we have about a minute left very quickly. David, uh, what is the ESG factor in, let's say, M&A? Is ESG something that people consider when they're making M&A uh, transactions or they don't really care about that? Well, all, all, all corporations are, are, are focused on this trend uh, and are thinking about transition. And there's an enormous amount of dialogue with respect to transition and how they use their capital and their resources to make sure their businesses are more sustainable. And so naturally, if you think strategically about that transition, companies are thinking about investments they can make, actions they can take, how they can deploy their capital. And one of the ways you can do that, uh, you know, is through the M&A market. I, I think we're at the beginning of a very, very significant industrial revolution of change and investment in new technologies and new opportunities for us to make our world more green, our planet safer, our community more sustainable, and any company that is looking forward and trying to position themselves competitively has to make sure they use all the tools at their disposal to make sure they execute that transition appropriately. Okay, a final question for Yasser as we close. Uh, Yasser, how important is, are ESG factors to you when, when you make uh, investment decisions for PIF? Very important. ESG is basically one of the first things that uh, we look uh, into, especially the E part, because the E part is more objective um, I have uh, a problem with the interpretation of the S and the G and the standardization of the S and the G. I mean, it's very much objective in the E. How much you're omitting, how can you um, rectify these things? But the problem is, what's the interpretation, what's the standardization of the governance? And I will give an example. Putting uh, a chairman and a CEO um, is accepted, uh, accepted in the U.S. and parts of Europe, but it's not accepted as part of the OECD principles. You have to separate the two. Now, which rating agency will pick this as a good point or a bad point? So the problem that I, uh, fa I'm facing with the ESG is the um, different rating agencies who are all working on different standards of how they're evaluating uh, the ratings. But the E part, we're all responsible for. Aramco, in fact, one of the lowest companies when it comes to emission, although it's the, one of the largest, actually the largest company in the world uh, in oil production. This has to be looked at and should be, you know, they should be rewarded. They should pay list taxes. You cannot treat companies who are doing good for the, for the environment like companies who are given no regards whatsoever to the environment. So we do take the ESG very serious uh, in Saudi Arabia and especially uh, within PIF since we own many, many of these portfolio companies. and thank you Yasser and your team for bringing together this uh, distinguished panel and uh, I will now turn it back to uh, the, the uh, rest of the program to uh, the host. Thank you very much. Thank you.